to write these down as I'm talking, you'll have uh, a copy of the answers. So Laura does not get to answer any questions in class tonight. So, because she has all the answers. Well, she thinks she does anyway, but that's another point. So, uh, I have those questions, and then she should have passed out to you as well. Uh, I know she did because I saw her. Uh, for next Sunday, chapter 12. If you didn't get a copy of those, be sure you get a copy of those. Uh, chapter 10, then, very quickly, just transitioning into chapter 11 is all I'm doing by noticing some things here uh, that also do it because of the upcoming chapter, chapter 12. It's, it's been uh, a good study for me the way that I've studied it this time uh, to see some really intertextual linking together of the text and to see how it's fitted together how, and sort of being able in, in, a, in a way to um, figure out what was in the mind of John when he wrote is, is always kind of a great uh, find when you can see, see it unfolding in your mind. So you look at chapter 10, 11, and they really are connected um, in, in the sense that we have uh, in chapter 10, the, I am the good shepherd, I am the door. Uh, there is Jesus working, uh, teaching us what a shepherd is. And of course, the model for elders. Elders are considered shepherds. And Jesus said, I know my sheep, my sheep know me. And so that's the relationship. Uh, elders are to know their sheep, or as there's a book out uh, by Lynn Anderson called uh, They Smell Like sheep, sheep, and it's a great title to a book about what it means to be an elder. And so that's, that's uh, you know, and I look at First Peter, the fifth chapter, in which the Apostle Peter makes the statement, <clears throat> so I... Exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock that is among you. So he uses that very term, shepherd. And so in 1 Peter 2, he talks about the great shepherd, which is, of course, Jesus. So it becomes an important metaphor for us to understand the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd and, and what, what uh, we are to do and how we're to support the elders, how the elders know us and, and that relationship. And, and it's not just a hierarchy. There is no hierarchy in the, in the Lord's church. It's a relationship that we have. So he, he, he's mentioning that in chapter 10. We find in, uh, I mean, in chapter 10, that's right, uh, and uh, so the Jews then at the Feast of the Dedication, which we talked about, was the Feast of Lights or the restoring of the, tavern, uh, the, restoring of the temple in uh, A.D. 164 when Antiochus of Epiphanes was driven out and, and uh, after he had corrupted the altar and all those sort of things. The point here is the Jews picked up stones again to stone Jesus because he said in verse 30, I and the Father are one meaning that not only uh, there's an equality, not only in what they're doing, but in their person, they're one. And so at the end of this little period of conflict, what, what's coming to an end, and it comes to an end in chapter 12, is the end of Jesus' public ministry. And notice in verse 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. At the end of chapter 12, Jesus goes away again, but he hides himself. Uh, you know, he's, uh, there's no express reason why he hid himself, but you can only imagine how, especially as John shows us some things that the rest of them don't show us, the rest of the gospel writers don't, but this is important to John because it's about Jews believing and unbelieving or about belief and unbelief. And that was really the focus of John more so than the rest of them. 
Matthew focuses on Jesus being a king. Uh, Luke focuses on Jesus being a worshiper, a, uh, a king, but not as much as Matthew does, uh, mainly on his humanity. Uh, Mark is probably... Uh, the point of Mark is that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of scriptures. That's how he begins. The gospel of Jesus Christ according, uh, you know, verse 1 of chapter 1 and then goes into Malachi 3 quoting from John the Baptist who's going to be the messenger that's going to announce the coming of Jesus and so forth. Uh, Mark 6 is God is among us. Do you see him? You find that over and over in the book of Mark. I mean, he's, he's pointing out that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you see him? And, and in some ways, the Gospel of John is like that. But at the end of chapter 12, there comes a sort of explanation by John, and we'll get to that on Sunday. But in, And it all hinges, all of this, and the reason I mention that, it all hinges on what happens in chapter 11 the resurrection of, of Lazarus from the dead becomes a very significant event. This is the seventh sign. I just, you know, the way John lays all this out is just interesting to me because it's like um, he saves the, the last for the best in that he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's impressive, and, and it is certainly an indication of turning the water into wine at Cana of Galilee and then healing the nobleman's son and then all these other healings on the Sabbath and so forth and walking on the water. And, but here's the seventh sign, and he's trying to, you know, all of these things are written that you might believe is the, is the purpose of, of the Gospel of John. John 20, verse 21, these things are written that you might believe. Many other signs that Jesus do. And so, you know, these are written that you might believe. Okay, so let's read a little bit in uh, Matthew, I mean, in uh, John beginning verse 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. You know, so let, me, let me stop here. The other thing, interesting thing about this is, I, I remember when Jason Cheney was here in the, in the gospel meeting, and, and he talked about this a little bit, and he brought, he, he, and one of the points he was making was about Martha gets such a bad rap because of Luke 10. You know, Martha, Martha, you're comforted about many things. Only one thing is necessary. And so she kind of gets a little rap, bad rap for that. But here you can see in chapter 11 and chapter 12, man, just how close Jesus is to them, to, to Mary and Martha and to Lazarus. I mean, they are really close friends. They are really, really, I mean, you really get that sense of that when you read this. And so it's just interesting to me that while Jesus was really, really close to them, he also sometimes had to say, hey, knock it off. That's not what this is about. Martha, Martha, you're coming about many things, but... You know, so, uh, but good friends do that for each other, don't they? They try to help each other and correct each other and, and encourage them. So it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Now that's in advance of chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, where John has the event recorded. He's just telling us ahead of time. Uh, they come to Bethany, which is about six miles, I think, from Jerusalem, if I remember correctly. Uh, as we have said before, in, in biblical geography, everything goes up to Jerusalem. And if anything says they're coming down, that means they're coming down out of Jerusalem because everything is down out of Jerusalem. You have to go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up, you know, on a hill. Uh, and so that's, uh, Bethany is probably um, one of the last stops before you get into into Jerusalem. It's very close, and so... They would stop there. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, 
This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, see, there's a, an expression there. And she's also said, the one you loved. And so there's a very close kinship between Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Remember, look at verse 31 of chapter 10. The Jews picked up stones and stones. And this is what uh, Philip says to him, or the disciples said to him, you know, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles. I said six. Okay, two miles, that's even closer. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Now, that's, to me, a little bit interesting, that Mary's the one that stays in the house. Uh, she doesn't run to Jesus. But I think, again, it's the nature of the two sisters. They're, you know, no two sisters are exactly alike. Uh, Martha is the one that is probably, um, I guess we would say probably in some ways type A personality. Mary, let's get this done. Let's 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 come on. Let's go. Let's get. Mary seems to be a little bit more laid back, going with the flow. So, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would never would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you." Jesus said to her, "Your brother will rise again." Martha said to him, "I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day." Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is a great confession right here, by the way, in the way that uh, Martha says this. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I mean, you cannot state who Jesus is any clearer, with any greater confidence, with any better strident tone than what she just said here. Now, as always with even us, uh, having this wonderful confidence and saying this in an abstract way is one thing, but in practice sometimes it becomes a little bit more difficult for us and we'll see that in just a second too but it you know it just tells us that these people that are in the bible are human like you and me uh and, and what i would say about this verse the verb tenses in the original language are settled conviction and in fact it's the only place in the new testament that the verb tenses are just exactly like this on this confession. I, that's why I say this. You, you can't say this any clearer. You can't say with any more conviction than what she stated here. Nobody can. And so she, she has this tremendous conviction about who Jesus is. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and, he's calling for you, and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, 
saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews also had come with her, also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, this, man, this woman who gave this incredible confession of who Jesus was. This, this woman is not about to say, Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Sometimes we say seeing is believing. Jesus said believing is seeing. If you believed, you would see, you see. Uh, and so it's going to take faith for you to, to do this. And, you know, so th there's, a, there's a moment there where even in spite of her settled conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and so forth, and Jesus said, roll away the stone, and she said, oh, Lord. I mean, he stinks by now. In four days, he's decomposing. And, and Jesus said, did I not tell you? You know, and so, again, so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen stri strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. You know what? I know I'm wired different, but when I think about Lazarus coming forth out of the grave, I'm thinking if I'm Lazarus, I'm a little, I'm a little upset. I liked, I liked where I was. I didn't want to come back here. Uh, I don't know what that conversation took place, but I just wonder how Lazarus felt about that. You know, being in a state of Abraham's bosom and Jesus had taught them in Luke, the 16th chapter, a place of rest and peace and security, awaiting the final judgment. And uh, here he has to come back to this earth again. I don't know. I'd be a little disappointed in that, I think, in one way, certainly. But I would know where I could bend and where I'm going to make sure I go. I was there, I know. Okay, so many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. You know, people just disappoint you, don't they? When they saw this, and so they run to Pharisees to try to cause and create problems for Jesus. And, you know, it just takes one person. And, and people do that, and, and it's just so disappointing that they, you know, they, they won't deal with what they see that's right in front of them, but they'll run off to the Pharisees. They know how the Pharisees feel, and so they're going to tell it to slant it really toward the Pharisees' uh, prejudice towards Jesus when they tell it. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? <coughs> if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went out from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And, where he, and there he stayed with the disciples. 
Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus, saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Okay, so that's our reading. Uh, I, I love that story. Everybody loves a resurrection, don't they? This is a great story, and uh, so a great account. So let's start with these questions. Uh, question number one, there are three places in John 11 that suggests a connection uh, with chapters 9 and 10. Can you give the verses and the connection? All right. This is a kind of a tough question, but I, I want you to see it because I want you to see how they're connected, this intertextual connection. In John 11, verse 4, he talks about the theme that this is the work for the glory of God. He died so that the glory of God and so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it and so on and so forth. The theme is the work of God. Chapter 9, verses 3 through 5, they asked him, well, this man that was born blind, did he sin or did his parents? And Jesus doesn't really ever answer that question. He said, no that the glory of God, and so they're both referring to the miracle that's going to happen, on the one hand to the healing of the blind man, to the other to Jesus' resurrection. Uh, then in chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, you have the theme of darkness and light again. That's common throughout chapter 8, 9, and 10 even. Uh, but 11, uh, chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, we have that same uh, statement. Um, oh, chapter 9. Yeah. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And so that's his connection to chapter 11 and verse, uh, chapter 11 and chapter 9. And then in chapter 11, verse 37, when we read in that passage, but some of them said, could not he open the eyes of the man, of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So that, that story about Jesus healing the blind man is still alive and well known. And that was in chapter 9. Also, we notice in chapter 10 it was mentioned, chapter 10, verse 21. And then, of course, the healing in chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. So in these three places, uh, these texts are linked. Yes. No one takes it from him by late. And verse 16 ought to be included. And I have sheep, other sheep not of this fold, meaning the Gentiles. So that would be a good tie-in. That would be a good point as well. Uh, good, good one. Okay. Question number two. What was the raising of Lazarus going to accomplish? It was what? It was to what? There you go. It was to glorify God. It was the event that was to symbolize the final event of Jesus as well, wasn't it? Okay, so uh, it was to demonstrate the ultimate power of God, to get the glory of God. You know, that's an interesting statement because in the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter, when the children of Israel are fleeing from Pharaoh, um, you know, God says three, two or three times, chapter 14, verse 4, chapter 14, verse 17, chapter 14, verse 18, I will get my glory over Pharaoh. Pharaoh thinks he's a god. And God said, I'm going to ultimately show him who's powerful here. And so this is the idea here. That the raising of Lazarus was going to accomplish to show who finally has the power. Okay, chapter 3. And, and, and all in an effort so that they could believe. If Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus can go into the tomb and be three days and three nights, then God can raise him too. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. So question number three, what is the disciples' objection in going to Judea? 
What did Thomas think was going to happen in Judea? Yeah, they were all going to get killed. Uh, that they were all going to die, verse 16 and verse 8 of John 11. And so the disciples asked Jesus a question in verse 8. Jesus answers them in verse 9 and 10. And what is Jesus trying to teach them in his answer? So eight the disciples said, you know, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus, what's he trying to teach them when he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, does not stumble because he sees the light or this world of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What's Jesus trying to tell them? How would you put that in our common everyday language? I mean, you're on the right track. That's, that's right. In the day, while he's, you're, you're in the right, you're in the ballpark. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're getting there too. You don't have to worry about it if you're following after Jesus. I think the point Jesus is making here is there's a sense in which, sa- in which duty comes before safety. You know, there's a risk here that they see him taking, and Jesus said, but while we have the opportunity, we take this opportunity. Our duty comes first. I think that's one of the, the lessons that he's trying to get across to them is that you don't take the safe way out always. Uh, uh, you know, if it comes to doing God's will, uh, if it comes to serving God, you don't take the safe way out in the sense of, of not doing that. keeps you from not doing it. Um, so I think that's a kind of an interesting point that he makes. It's, it's also something else he says, you know, in John 9, that we walk while we have the light. Uh, you know, while we have the opportunity, we do what we can. We do what we're supposed to do. Okay? Uh, Some things have to be done in spite of the risk that's involved, and it was duty and not safety that was the priority here for Jesus. And Jesus was trying to teach them that as long as they walked in the clear path of duty, they would not go wrong. If you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about having done the wrong thing. Okay? Now, question number five. How did Jesus view death? How did Jesus view death? Temporary. Give me a more specific word. There you go. Being asleep. Now, over in the book of Exodus, in the 17th, in, in the ninth chapter, in verse 31, in the Mount of Transfiguration, you turn your Bibles there and look, you'll have a marginal note there that tells us how Jesus looked at death again. In Luke 9 and verse 31, this is at the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, verse 31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish. If you have a marginal note in your Bible, which you probably do, it'll say Exodus. If we do a word association game to you with you, and I say the word Exodus, what do you think of? Going out, leave. What else? Transition? What are they going out of? What were they leaving? Slavery. Freedom from slavery. And so Jesus saw death as sleep, not permanent, temporary. And then he saw it as freedom. He saw it as a departure from this world, from the order of this world, from the sickness and sadness and sorrows and disappointments and heartaches. What would you say, Betty? Yeah, from the bondage of sin. Uh, If you go over to Romans, the 8th chapter, and notice the passage there, beginning at verse uh, 
18, he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time <coughs> are not worthy, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. In other words, the futility of this life, we're subject to death. But that wasn't God's plan from the beginning. Not willingly, he says. But what does God do in the interim for us? But because of him who subjected in hope, he gave us hope then. When sin came in, it destroyed and marred God's intentions, and so he couldn't go back and redo everything. He couldn't make man a robot so they'd never sin. He had to give him free will. And so because man sins, what does God give him? He gives him hope. Hope from what? Keep reading with me here. Uh, that the creation itself will be set free from, a, from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And that's what Betty was talking about, the bondage to sin, freedom. We'll have that. We'll escape all that. Okay, any comments or questions on anything I've said tonight so far? All right, let's move along then. Um, given Question number six. Given Thomas Thomas's reaction to Jesus, let us go to him, Lazarus. How would you describe his attitude in verse 16 when... He said there, okay, let's go if we, you know, let's just go die with him. Uh, how would you describe his, uh, let me read it to you. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Do, uh, how would you describe that, that mindset to say that? And do you think Thomas's faith at this point was where Martha's faith was uh, in verse 16 and 27 that we talked about? earlier where she had to settle the conviction. Okay. Well, I don't think any of us do. I think that's the point. I think he, he I, I mean, he's willing to follow. You have to give him that. You have to give him that. I mean, there's a sort of bravery here, a courage here that, that he's willing to do that. But he's, a, he's rather pessimistic, isn't he? So we're going to go there and die. And yeah, yeah. And so he was, you know, sort of pessimistic about the whole thing of going back there, thinking they were going to die. And let, okay, well, let's just go die. That's what, that's what we're being called to do. Uh, so there seems to be when we compare the faith of, of Martha to his, he doesn't have that exactly settled conviction about the resurrection and the life and all that sort of thing. Uh, there seems to be a certain air of confusion and despondency. I think he represents, in, in a lot of ways, I think he represents that air of confusion and despondency among all of the disciples. <clears throat> because when we get over to chapter 12, uh, and you read... There in chapter 12, verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. So <clears throat> even they didn't understand what was going on. They were confused about uh, the situation. So while Thomas's faith was brave, it wasn't necessarily triumphant. Martyrdom was what he was prepared for as a matter of duty. Uh, he, does not, he does not, like Martha, confess his faith in Jesus and in overcoming death. But he's willing to face death. He's willing to follow him. And so there's a sense that you have to admire that. Uh, Charlie? Well, uh, Lazarus is dead. I'm glad for your sake that this has happened, Jesus said. 
So it's with Jesus that they're going to die with. The Jews have already picked up stones to stone them. Uh, the question's already been asked, you know, are we going there to get stoned, to get put to death? And he said, okay, well, if, that, if that's what he's saying, then let's go die with him. Let's go die with the Lord. So I don't think he's talking about Lazarus in this, uh, in this situation, the him here in verse 19. Let us go, also go that we may die with him. I think go, uh, to die with him is to go with Jesus, to die with him. I think that's what they thought. Very pessimistic view. <clears throat> okay. But a good thought. Um, question, question number seven. What I am statement is found in John 11? That's right. I am the resurrection and the life. Why was Jesus deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled in verse 33? I think if we consider the first phrase, that's true. It shows the human side of him. Okay, that he, and that he had compassion as we read the rest of that. Uh, he was deeply moved in spirit. It is not so much an emotional response of sorrow, but he's angry. It's, it, it's of indignation. And what was the cause of Jesus' indignation? Death. That was the great enemy of the human race. And it was for victory over death that Jesus came to free them from their fear of death, Hebrews 2, verse 14. And being troubled, agitated, the same word that was used to, the, uh, remember when the, the lame man said, well, I, at a certain time when the, when the water is troubled or agitated. And so uh, the point is Jesus was not unmoved. He was not unmoved by the human spectacle of death, though he had the power of death. And so he, he felt, uh, as uh, Betty said, he was very compassionate. And, and Jesus wept. And, um, you know, a man of sorrows, Isaiah 53. Okay, any, any other comments on that? Anybody would like to make? Yeah. Yeah, and be angry at death. I mean, Jesus was angry. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. So his emotions were not completely internal. Uh, Jesus wept in John 11, verse 36. I'm going to go through these. Uh, Jesus wept and he spoke more of his intensity. That, that idea that Jesus wept spoke more of his intensity rather than the feeling of just uncontrollable sobbing and wailing. Question, his humanity, exactly. And we forget that, don't we, sometimes? Pardon me? Yeah, uh, yeah, that he does grieve over everyone. Um, question number 10, why would Martha object to Jesus' request to take away the stone? Uh, when you think about her confession in verses 27 and 39, is there an inconsistency on Martha's part? What does Jesus tell Martha that believing will do for her? It's one thing to believe theoretically, abstractly. It's sometimes quite another to practice it in this case. You know, going back to the question about Thomas, I think the thing to admire about him is, as opposed to the Peter incident, when Peter said, I'll go with you even if it means dying, here the situation was right upon them. And he's ready to go right then and there. Peter's thinking in terms future, yeah, I'll go with you, you know, when that happens. But now it's right here, and so Thomas goes. And I think there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, so considering that, um, it was one thing to confess the theoretical belief. It's sometimes quite another to practice it. And in this case, to roll away the stone that concealed the corruption of death in expectation that the impossible of the, of the impossible she would be able to see the glory of God. You can pass those out now, Laura. 
Uh, uh, We've got just a couple minutes. Go ahead and p- pass those ones out with the answers on them for tonight. Uh, so question number 11, against the sense of reason, common sense, which told her that Lazarus' body was already in a state of decay, what did Martha do regarding the Lord's command to take away the stone? Yeah, you say so. She obeyed. You notice it says they, they, they that were there would have included her. They moved the stone. Uh, What did Jesus do before he cried out, Lazarus, come out? He prayed. He gave glory to God. That's right. He prayed and gave thanks before anything ever happened. I know you always hear me. Uh, And then in verses 45 through 48, uh, the council accuses Jesus and the consequences of his actions with several things. What is the one thing they never did? They accused him of a lot of things, but what is the one thing they never did? I'll say that again, Gary. Okay. This, that's true. This time they didn't do that, but something they never did, they never considered. What's the one thing they never considered? It's, it's right there in front of your face. They never considered that he was telling the truth, that he was who he said he was, that he was the Son of God. And so it's always it's strange to me that, that people reason that way. You know, rather than take the claims that he's making and look at them and say, okay, how, does, how is he proving that? And instead, they're just making all of these things that he didn't do. They're taking this very nationalistic view of him, uh, that, that he's here to disrupt our our nation, the Romans are going to come in and take away from it, and it's in that context uh, that that you know we, you know one should die for the people. Uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees interpreted the raising of Lazarus uh, within a uh, context of concern, really for national security. The Romans hear about this; they're going to come in and do all this, and Jesus is placed. Uh, in that category of being uh, an anti-Roman agitator. That's how they're going to see him, and so then they're going to come and punish. They certainly didn't want that. They never considered that he might be who he said he was. Unbelief never remains static. It is by faith it is by nature progressive, and what it ends up doing is killing them. They never, their unbelief killed them. So what is the point of Caiaphas' prediction in verses 49 through 50, and how does John expand Caiaphas' prediction? Uh, it is true that Jesus would die, but not only as a matter of expediency, but for the redemption and salvation of the whole human race. Also gather into one the children of God. You compare that to chapter 10 and verse 16 where God is going to appoint them one shepherd and gather them into one fold. The irony is so thick in John 11 in those verses that I just read. I mean, it is, it is so filled with irony. All right, our class is done. I'm 30 seconds over time.